This is a Scott radio from 1931. This is called the All Wave 12. And the reason it's called that is because All Wave, meaning it picks up AM broadcast band up through the short wave bands, and 12 meaning the number of tubes. They later on went all the way up to the All Wave 23 later on, and of course those had 23 tubes. Well, this was the first of the All Waves, and a lot of times it's called the dual dial model. As you can see here, it's got two dials. Um, shortly after this came out, they switched over to a single dial model, which was a lot easier to operate. But um, it's a superheterodyne receiver. And in 1931, superheterodyne was a, a big thing. They started making superheterodynes in 1924. RCA ended up with a patent. And if you wanted to manufacture radios with a superheterodyne circuit, you had to pay royalties to RCA. Uh, the same thing goes for AVC, automatic volume control. Uh, the patent was owned by another company, I believe Philco had it for a while, and um, they were selling royalties. So if you wanted automatic volume control, you had to pay for that. So it was expensive to get into the radio manufacturing business. Now Scott was considered the top of the line. These things were frightfully expensive, and I saw that uh, I think I saw a price like $6,000 in modern day money for one of these. Their stuff was always chrome plated for whatever reason. And a lot of people just left the, the chassis out uh, with no cabinet. You could buy it this way. and Or they would sell a cabinet and you could install it yourself in the cabinet. Now to do that you had to do a little bit of carpentry work. But it came like it is here with uh, this is the off on switch and it came just like this. This is the original uh, cotton covered wire and it even has a wooden little uh, fascia there for the off on switch. You drill a hole in your cabinet and mount this on there and it came with this wooden face plate which is in perfect condition and these are the original knobs and you cut a hole in your face of your cabinet and screwed it in there. It's got mounting flanges here so you can screw it down to a shelf inside the cabinet. So this radio, um, as I said, is a super heterodyne uh, with no AVC. So one has to uh, keep one hand on the throttle, so to speak. Uh, looking at the controls here, this is the sensitivity switch. It's three positions. And this is the uh, main tuning, which changed the frequency. And this was the RF stage that sort of acted as a preamplifier that you could adjust for a maximum signal. So you really had to, to adjust both of these anytime you change station. Usually I, I would keep one hand on the left and one hand on the right and gradually tune across the band. This is the, uh, well, they call it the volume control, but really what this does is control the voltage on the screens of all the IF and the RF amplifiers. So it's adjusting the RF gain and not the actual audio gain. The audio amplifier is part of the power supply chassis, and um, it uses push-pull outputs. These are type 45 tubes and an 80 type rectifier tube, full wave rectifier, and a transformer uh, on the input and the output of the uh, amplifier. And the radio itself has a first audio stage and it is also push-pull, believe it or not, it is the first audio stage. And uh, here's your detector. Uh, this is a triode tube detector, and it feeds out to and drives these. And this has a transformer going into it, a center tap transformer. So you got a transformer going into the preamp and a 
transformer coming out of it and then a transformer coming out of the uh, push-pull audio amplifier. So there's four tubes involved here. These tubes, these triode tubes, uh, and this also are, uh, are Octurus, Octurus tubes. And uh, I'll show you these. They're blue. And all Octurus tubes for this radio are blue tubes. And there's uh, one, two, three, I think there's four, um, if I'm right, four tubes. And <clears throat> these are all blue tubes and they are really something to see <laughs> but they're four pins filament grid and plate not much to it um, so starting over here uh, this is your RF amplifier tube and um, this is your uh, uh, converter or mixer tube or first detector whatever you want to call it and this is your oscillator tube. So it feeds into this, and the RF feeds from here back into this, and it's mixed in this transformer, and out she goes to the IFs. Now the IFs are one, two, three, four IF cans, and three IF tubes, amplifier tubes, and these are um, uh, 24, type 24. These blue tubes are type uh 127 or 227 or just plain 27 and i don't think a plain 27 was blue um back in those days uh the tubes and the patents were a big mess and uh there was a lot of fighting going on between companies uh you know one company would invent a 27 tube nobody else could could manufacture it then somebody would come out with a 127 which was the same tube and it would be blue and the other would be clear and yeah, it was a big mess. So anyway, so uh, you've got, uh, like I said, shortwave and AM, but uh, there's no band switch here. So how do you change bands? Well, that's done with plug-in coils. And this model was the one and only model that, and right before the, the new model came out, this had to have plug-in uh, coils. So there's two of them. This right here and this right here is a plug-in coil. You say, well, it doesn't look like a plug-in coil. Well, boy, you look. <laughs> there you go. Scott, 200 to 550 meters. Now that's your oscillator um, coil right there, and you can pull it out and stick in the uh, one of, um, oh, I think it was like four different ones, uh, short wave coils. And then, of course, uh, once you changed it and put the short wave in, you left the can off. That was required. The can would interfere with it. Now, let's see, here's the other one. There's the uh, RF coil. So that takes care of that. Now, uh, that seems simple. However, you had to also take this plate cap off. And as you see here, we've got another wire with a a cap on it you take this one off and put that one on okay that takes care of the RF section it changes the wiring really <laughs> and uh, let's see if I can get that back on with one hand yeah so uh, then over here you have uh, another situation where you take this off take that cap off and here is a wire hanging here which doesn't do anything until you hook it up. All right, and that's your uh, mixer or your first detector. And that takes care of uh, the mixer switching. <laughs> so, and so on the back, <clears throat> one more thing to do is your antenna connection. And that's right here. I've got a piece of wire hooked into it now. That's a well, push-in lock connectors. That's where your antenna normally goes for broadcast band reception. This is the ground over here. So what you do is you take your antenna loose from here, bring it up here to the top of the chassis and hook it right there. Isn't that handy? Of course, it makes it even more fun if you got a cabinet. So they sold cabinets with lids and the lid, you could lift the lid up and do the coil change 
and uh, make your other changes here from the top. Um, so that's the way it works. Now, over here, this is your oscillator variable capacitor, and it's got two, two gangs, one for shortwave, one for uh, broadcast band, and these are just trimmers. And then over here, you got kind of the same type of thing. This is the RF section. So it's pretty easy to align. These three IFs are 470 KC IFs. That's the frequency they were using at the time. Um, the original superheterodynes used a, a very low frequency, like 60 KC or something like that. It actually had iron core transformers. So Scott, um, he came from, E.H. E. Scott is his name, and he came from New Zealand, and he came over to Chicago, and he started a, the Scott Transformer Company. Well, this was his first radio, and when it came out, it was called the uh, Scott Transformer Receiver, um, the All Wave 12. And if you go searching for it on online, if you just look for the E.H. Scott Company All Wave 12, you're going to have, have a hard time trying to find it because it just... Uh, it, it's, it's called the uh, the Scott Transformer Company. <laughs> That's what I, it took me forever to figure that out. So, um, let's see here. I know you would like to see underneath. And so we're going to attempt to uh, lift this thing up and uh, show it real quick if we can without without tearing something up. But, um, all right, now, under here, it doesn't look like there's much there, you know? Uh, it's really interesting that uh, we have a big interstage transformer here. That's, that's for the audio going from the detector uh, to, the, uh, to the audio section. I'll set off my car alarm here. All right. So, um, when I got this thing, I couldn't believe how, you know, clean it was. And the only part that had been changed was the, um, the gain pot here for the RF stage. I guess it wore out or something, and somebody had changed it. It's got an off-on switch on the back that's not being used. It's just a 100K pot. And I guess it takes a beating because it's got some high voltage on it. And there's your B-plus wire right there. <laughs> and it goes to the main umbilical cord there. Um, there's only one thing that I did, and I didn't really have to do it, but down here, this is the cathode bypass uh, resistor capacitor for the uh, first audio amplifier. And it's only got... I think it's a 0.01 microfarad, maybe a 0.1, but it's it wasn't enough, uh, in my humble opinion. And I put that uh, electrolytic on there, and that boy, it brought the bass out. The, the problem was back in those days, a capacitor as big as this. Uh, well, here's an eight. That's an eight microfarad right there, and uh, I think that one there is 470 or something. It's it's pretty high. But it's enough to uh, get the audio off the cathode, and it just, uh, the bass just jumped right out at me, and I just left it on there. That's the only change. These, these resistors are all original. Capacitors are are all original, and those big things like that metal box there, that's the capacitor. These um, resistors, I like to call them bed resistors. Uh, you read them by reading the body and the end and the dot color, BED, and that tells you the value. There you are, the body's brown, the dot or the end is green, and uh, the dot is your multiplier. So guess what? 1200 ohms. So that's uh, that's the way they worked back in those days, and they're pretty big. Um, so these cans down here, these shiny, shiny cans, those are RF chokes. Uh, those keep the RF from getting back from the uh, IF transformer into the B plus line. So there's uh, one, two, four, five, five of those things.
That's pretty interesting, huh? Look at that wiring, how, how long it is. Now, I don't have any trouble with the uh, feedback, but that's really asking for it. <laughs> um, let's see, oh, here's something cool. When you plug in a certain coil, this, there's a center pin on it. I think it's the short wave coils. When you plug those in, that trips the switch right here at the switch. There's one there and there's one down here. Uh, where is that? Right, in, right there. That's a switch in the middle. I didn't even have to clean these things. I mean, this, this stuff all just worked. There's that um, gain control pot right there. It's kind of a coarse um, antenna tuner that changes the tap on the input to the RF amplifier. And uh, that's a tremor right there, a tremor capacitor. Gigantic thing. Um, so, I think that's about, about it. And we're going to uh, let's take a little look at the power supply here before we get carried away. Yeah. Um, this power supply, I, it, when I got it, it was sort of a mess because somebody had, had let me turn it over here, somebody had modified it. And it had, a, of course, all the capacity, the electrolytics were all bad. And they, somebody had already changed it out with some kind of a can. But anyway, I put new, uh, brand new electrolytics in here. So there's three of those. Those are 47 microfarad compared to eight. Uh, believe me, there's no hum. Um, the uh, output transformer was originally mounted on the speaker. And I didn't get the speaker. And uh, also the field coil for the, uh, for the power supply acted as a, um, a choke for the power supply inductor. And I, of course I didn't have that. So I just put a resistor in there, approximately the right value. And that turned out pretty good. Um, and also, as you can see all the way across up through here, uh, if I can, find my finger here all the way across the edge of this chassis was this gigantic resistor that had taps on it uh, and that was gone and uh, so I got some new resistors and I, I mounted them over here on a terminal strip to take the place of that and uh, that worked out just great well since I didn't have any output transformer uh, I used uh, a little uh, 70 volt line transformer in its place and it worked real good uh, it's obviously not original uh, but you can do that I and mean, this is just a, a little radio shack transformer you figure out where the center tap is on the primary in the middle there and uh, tap both sides for the best sound and uh, outcomes i'm using the 16 ohm output to go to the speaker and that worked out gave you the best uh, tone balance and that worked out just fine uh, the other problem was that the interstage transformer that uh, the interstage transformer that used to sit right in here uh, between the uh, the first audio and the uh, the push pull outputs that transformer had a bad uh, secondary so, uh, you can't get it. I mean, I could have bought something else for a hundred bucks or something, but here it is. That's, that's the, uh, transformer that came out of it. And, uh, so what I did was just use an RC coupling to just eliminate it. And all it took was uh, a capacitor on each side where the primary had been and a plate resistor and a grid resistor and, did a wave of 10 pounds of ugly weight. And uh, actually, I think it may sound better. I don't know. Works fine, though. Uh, it would be easy to retrofit it if you found a, a transformer somewhere. Uh, the holes are still there. You know, you just uh, bolt it back in and hook the wires back up and you're done. But anyhow, uh, there's the other end of the, uh, the main power cord. Now, that carries um, three different B-plus voltages. 
to the receiver and uh, the filament, which is these big fat wires right there, and it's your filaments. Uh, that's a two and a half volt filament. Everything in here is two and a half volt filament, which uh, I wasn't too, I wasn't used to that at all. Excuse me. Uh, now, now we're gonna we're gonna turn it on. <laughs> uh, let's see here if I can get to this little switch. Let me flip the switch here. All right, now she has lit up. All right. Uh, so all of our tubes should be lighting up. There's the blue. Oh, not cute. All right. Let's see if we can get this thing hooked up here and working. I hope I may have knocked a speaker wire loose or something here. I did. <laughs> I just got an old eight-inch speaker down here that I, I hooked up, and uh, and there we go. All right, here we go. Try not to play music because YouTube gets all upset. Yeah, loosen up. Knock the antenna loose. So that we tune it in. And then we peek it up, when the brightness like so. All the angels That's the way we tune it. Uh, it's um, 5, 5.20 here in the afternoon. So it'll... It's as sensitive as... About anything I've seen. And what you're supposed to do is start out on the lowest uh, sensitivity position and then turn it up if needed. But, uh, we also have our Sunday services at 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. with our pastors, Javier and Veronica Fernandez that they are always there having a word for us. This has been, this has been talked over fast in seven minutes. No, this is a preview though of some of the cool stuff. Okay, well anyway, you can see how it works. And I've gone through just about everything I can think of. So I will say thanks for watching and I'll Hope you enjoyed the old Scott Hallway 12.